Welcome, LA Progressive friends and family. Today I have with me Melina Abdullah. Now in Southern California, Melina really needs no introduction, but uh, there are some people across the nation who may need uh, uh, an introduction. And Melina is the vice presidential candidate who is running on the Cornell West ticket with Dr. Cornell West. Um, Dr. Cornell West announced Melina as his uh, VP selection in March, I think it was, no, April, in April. And let me just tell you a little bit about Melina and then I'll let you let her take the take the mic, so to speak, because uh, she really doesn't need any prompting from me. She's a professor of Pan-African Studies at Cal State LA's College of Ethnic Studies. She's the co-founder of Black Lives Matter Los Angeles and Black Lives Matter Grassroots where she's also the director. She is a leader in the California Faculty Association, the faculty union, both locally and statewide, and she's a mama of three. She earned her PhD from the University of Southern California in political science and her bachelor's from Howard University in African-American studies. Melina has authored numerous articles and book chapters, and she's known by the moniker Doc Melly Mel. She's a creator, host, and producer of radio programs, uh, Move the Crowd, Move the Crowd On, on KPFK 90.7 FM, and This Is Not a Drill on KBLA Talk 1580. She's a recognized expert on race, gender, class, and social movements. Welcome, Melina. Thank you so much, Sharon. It's great to be with you. Oh, it's it's so awesome. I imagine that you must be exhausted. We are just uh, what uh, sixty days, yeah, <laughs> away from the election. So it must be uh, it must have been an exhausting. I'm, so tell me, how did you feel when Cornell West uh, contacted you? Stunned. Um, <laughs> so I had been and enthusiastic supporter of his campaign. So he announced in June of 2023. And so I'd been following his campaign and really felt um, enthusiastic because for the first time I felt like I was voting for someone. Um, and so I was grateful that he was running. I had been in fundraising spaces with him. I'd been in um, spaces, he came and spoke at our 10 year anniversary of Black Lives Matter. And I'd been following his work as an intellectual since the time I was an undergrad. So I was first introduced to Race Matters. Well, it came out when I was an undergrad. Um, and so he'd been someone who'd been very influential in my intellectual work. And then there was the work that he's been doing on the ground. So the Black Lives Matter work, the work in support of ethnic studies, all of that. So again, I thought I was a supporter of Dr. West and was happy and grateful to be that. And then had him on my radio show, This Is Not a Drill on KBLA, and um, had a wonderful conversation. You can't really call them interviews, you've had him. When you, when you talk with Dr. West, it's a conversation um, because who knows where it's gonna go. It might, might wind up, you talk for an hour about jazz or philosophy or, homelessness. Um, and so we had had a really wonderful conversation on KBLA. And two days later, he and his wife, Anahita, called me. And there was kind of some pausing in the conversation, which is not the normal way conversation with him goes. And finally, Anahita says to him, well, just ask her. And so he, he said, will you be my running mate? And, you know, my heart danced immediately and I wanted to say yes immediately. And I also recognized that I'm a mama and a daughter and a movement sibling and needed to check with a few folks. So I told him that, that I want to say yes, but I have to check. So the first people I called in were my children and they were all in. And then I called my parents and my siblings and they were all in. Then I called my family in Texas, they were all in. Then I called my movement family and everybody was all in. And so in April, actually the announcement was made 
on the holiest day of the year for Muslims um, on Eid. We made the announcement on Eid and um, it was just a tremendous blessing. And immediately after making the announcement, um, I went over to my community, Isla, um, in Los Angeles, and it was even more beautiful uh, being greeted there as the first Muslim vice presidential candidate, the first Muslim to be on any presidential campaign ticket. Wow, wow, that's that's a that's quite an achievement. And speaking of achievements, now you have been known in Southern California as a movement builder. Um, you have for the longest, oh, I, for more than 10 years now, because I know that um, Black Lives Matter um, LA started more than 10 years ago because you had the 10 year anniversary and Dick and I were there. Um, so I guess you're into like the 12th year now, going into the 12th year. So you've been a movement builder, you've been a professor, um, and I shouldn't say these things in past tense because you currently are those things. And also a, a talk show host and a writer, but I never saw you. I never saw you being involved in electoral politics. And I think we've even had this conversation about the role of electoral politics in making major social change in this country. So um, I guess I what I'm interested in understanding is, do you believe now that electoral politics can bring this country closer to the ideals that it purports, that it it holds? So you're writing your assessment of me and we've been um, in many, many spaces. I've been also fortunate to be a contributor to the LA Progressive from time to time. Yes. Um, and so I, I think you have a pretty good grasp of who I am. I said I would never, ever, ever run for elective office. I would never do that. And then I used to give myself an out and say, well, unless it's school board or something directly related to education, because I'm an educator, right? Um, and my kids go to LAUSD. And so, you know, I would open up that possibility, but I was, I would even say things like, I'd never run for legislature or Congress, or I never said the vice presidency, because that was never even fathomable, right? But I, I said, I would never, ever, ever run for elective office, right? But I always understood the power of electoral politics and the importance of electoral politics. My degree, my PhD is actually in political science. And so I study electoral politics um, and thought I would be content to study and kind of throw rocks from the outside. Um, and in some ways, I guess that's what this campaign is, not throwing rocks, but offering an alternative. And so I was on the phone with our campaign manager earlier, just a few moments ago, and we were talking about um, runs for office. And I said, I have absolutely no political ambition. And I think that's what you're reading. I don't have any political ambition. I don't want to be in a space so that I can have a word in front of my name, right? Vice president in front of my name, right? Um, but I think what this offers us a really unique opportunity to do is to advance a vision that is entrenched in and derives from the movement work that you were talking about and the intellectual work that you mentioned, that we have an opportunity to uplift a vision for the world, right? We have an opportunity in this next two months to be as loud as we can about why we have to be Harriet Tubman abolitionists and not simply tinker around the edges of fundamentally unjust systems like policing and prisons, but why we have to say, you know, real safety for black folks and by extension, everybody else begins with providing communities with all the resources that are necessary for them to be safe in the first place and fostering what it does, what it has been to actually bring in safe spaces, right? So making sure that we resource um, community interventionists and prevention workers and talk about how we actually can have housing, whereas Pete White would say housing with the would your mama live there test, right? Um, housing for everybody is really actually an easy task. And I know we say that it's 
difficult. And um, I think the 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 state of California has spent now, you know, tens of millions of dollars addressing homelessness when those tens of millions of dollars could have really helped to buy housing or provide housing for people who are unhoused, right? It's really a simple question. It's a question of priorities and our willingness to invest in our vision. Currently, the United States spends 62% of every dollar on war. What if we were to take off, you know, even a percentage of that money? You know what we could do? We could house everybody. We could educate everybody. I know people are talking about paying down their student loan debt. Well, our vision is, you know, even if we think about what the master plan for higher education was in the state of California in the first place, and most of, of the public universities share the same vision, they were supposed to be tuition-free universities. Universities should be free. In fact, education pre-K through PhD should be free. That's a vision-based plan, right? If we were to take back those dollars, that's without even talking about corporations and the rich paying their fair share, just the dollars that are already there could house everybody, could feed everybody, could educate everybody, could provide health care for all in a way that also addresses medical apartheid. And then when we talk about making corporations pay their share, when we talk about making the rich pay their share, we can also have not just a plan to study reparations, we could also pay reparations, right? There's a lot that we can do. And so I think that that's what pulled me into, I know that's what pulled me into this campaign is that it's a unique effort. And I've had conversation with some of my dear friends who are in the major political parties and they're saying, look, right now you have inroads. You can talk to the major parties, well, one of the major parties about, um, about your vision. And I think you could get somewhere. And that's, you know, probably true. I probably could have those conversations now and there probably would be, and Dr. West has been more, more forthcoming about conversations than he that he's had. Um, or that have been he's been approached with about that. But the thing is, we don't want to tinker around edges. I don't want to talk about passing a George Floyd Justice and Policing Act that's absent of ending qualified immunity and simply puts George Floyd's name on something that really does nothing for safety for Black people, right? I don't want to talk about simply ending book bans, although you know, one of the things Black Lives Matter Grassroots is for um, is, you know, we've partnered with Ayanna Presley, uh, who's a congresswoman out of uh, out of Massachusetts, actually, on both of those bills on an ending qualified immunity act and also a freedom to read act. But we also want to envision something larger around education. Yes, we got to stop book bans and have the freedom to read. And we have to have the kind of vision that's grounded in my discipline, my discipline, um, actually, and, and if you let me go too far, I'll tell the story of how Black studies as a high schooler, it actually saved my life quite literally. And so when we talk about education, when we talk about public safety, when we talk about what people have a right to, we want to be grounded in vision. And that's what this campaign is about. This campaign is also really tied to movement. And so I know now there's folks talking about reparations, especially given what's happened in California over the last week and people being in office and really betraying their constituencies, especially their black constituents. Um, there's a lot of folks giving lip service now on the left, especially to reparations, but we need you to be on the ground all the time, not just campaign season, right? And that's kind of what our commitment, not kind of, that's what our commitment is. It's absolutely, we have an opportunity to advance these visions through November 5th, but also on November 6th, we continue to do the work to really transform the world into one that works 
for Black people, for Indigenous people, for poor people, for all oppressed people in the United States. And it has a global impact as well when we talk about a free Palestine, when we roll money back for more, you know, beginning by saying a complete arms embargo to the state of Israel and a complete free Palestine, not simply a ceasefire, but also a free Palestine ending a system of colonialism that's been there for 76 years. But there's also been a vision before a colonized Palestine, right? And so what we have an opportunity to do has an impact in the United States, but also has an impact globally. Great, great. Well, I'll give you an opportunity to talk about how the your Black Studies uh, class in high school saved your life, literally. But let's move on and talk a little bit about the platform. And I, I want to um, preface this by saying that when I think about um, the, the uh, West Abdullah platform, I believe in my heart of hearts, in ev every person I've ever met in my in my life, this is what they really want. This is what everyone wants. When you talk about education should be available to everyone for free, there are a, there's a small minority of people who think, no, no, no. But we understand that that's an investment in our country. It's an investment in the future of our children. And if we want to have a strong economy, a strong country, we need to educate the populace. The, every single thing listed on that platform is first, it's doable, it's essential and most people want it. So why is it that the major parties don't go there? So let's talk about the platform. Sure, so the platform includes what I love is our policy pillars, almost all of them, in with the word justice, right? And so our overall platform is a platform of truth, justice, and love. Truth, justice, and love. You just spoke in essential truth that these pillars are things that everyone believes in unless they are um, morally corrupt, spiritually corrupt, and think only they are entitled to these things, right? Um, I'm in the midst and you know, Sharon, I'll go off on a, <laughs> on a side track a bit, but I, I'll just, I'll bring it back quickly. So um, I'm teaching a class right now because I'm still teaching, right? Because we're not running as as mainstream candidates that have, you know, a corporate tax base to PAC funds and big money funds that fund us to be just on the campaign trail. So I'm teaching a class um, right now called Intersectional Blackness, and it's part of our master's program in Pan-African Studies at Cal State LA, which I'll say as a plug is the first master's program in the CSU and the second master's program in Black Studies um, in the state of California. And so I feel very fortunate to have been able to see that through. And now we have, um, this year we'll have our first graduating cohort. And so I'm teaching intersectional Blackness and um, we're starting the class where tomorrow we'll have our um, class meeting ending our first reading to talk about our first reading. And the class begins with um, one of my favorite books by one of my three favorite authors, um, Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sore, right? And so we're reading Parable of the Sore and anybody who's not read it should read it, right? But Parable of the Sore is about this, um, people would call it kind of dystopian, about this kind of near future where the world is overtaken by capitalist interest. Um, the world is overtaken by white supremacist interests that converge. The world is overtaken in such a way that when you talk about the degradation of the planet, it's having very real effects. But there's this young woman, Lauren Olamina, who has this vision for the world, right? Who has this vision, which are called um, earth seeds, right? And it's grounded in these ideas um, about spirituality and about community and about what we have a right to and what we can build when we dare to move forward in our vision. And so that's what these pillars are really about, is about daring to move forward in our vision and shaking off 
those forces that pull us back, not just in Parable of the Sore, um, but in really every dystopian film or novel, right? There's these overarching kind of forces that um, I forgot some of the other films that I, I've watched in the past, but that force, you know, the people underground or the people to live in caves. And to a lesser degree, that's what we're experiencing in the world now where you work and work and work and people have three and four and five jobs and they're working and there's no time. It's stripping us of our humanity and our divinity and our creativity. And so these pillars are based on what we can have. And I think that the corporate duopoly, and by that, I mean the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, um, really is tethered to capitalism. And I know people like to, to put um, kind of caveats on capitalism and call it like, well, it's predatory capitalism. No, it's all capitalism, right? Capitalism is based on the unpaid labor of the worker, right? And so capitalism is based on, it's grounded in exploitation. Now you can lessen it to a degree and have a kinder, gentler version of exploitation, just like in chattel slavery, if you read some of the slave narratives, some of our enslaved ancestors would talk about their owners as feeding them and giving them a safe place to live. It was still chattel slavery, right? Capitalism is capitalism is capitalism, right? And so when you talk about a Republican Party and a Democratic Party who are both owned by corporate interests, those who reap profit from the unpaid labor of the worker, those who reap profit from the Amazons of the world, not the, the Chris Smalls of the world, right? And represent, and Chris Smalls is the founder of the Amazon Workers Union, right? Um, just a regular black man, just a regular young brother, right? With, you know, that looks like a rapper, right? <laughs> just a regular young brother who beat Jeff Bezos, right? Who beat Jeff Bezos, who was trying to kill the Amazon Workers Union. And Chris beat Jeff Bezos, right? You know, if you have a corporate duopoly who sides with Jeff Bezos, and I know he's in Amazon over Chris Smalls, you're only going to have the possibility of debating as you think about these minimum wage debates where Kamala Harris, who's supposed to be the smiling version of capitalism is saying, I don't know if we can, this country can afford a $15 an hour minimum wage. Of course, the country can afford a $15 an hour minimum wage. Minimum wage in the Bay Area is $20 an hour for fast food workers, right? Minimum wage in California is already $18. And the minimum wage that would be the bare necessity for workers in this country to be able to live is $27 an hour. So what are you talking about? I don't know if we can afford $15 an hour. We have multi-billionaires in this country. And then we have people who are living on the streets by the tens of thousands. So anyway, I know I'm going on a tangent, but the policy pillars are grounded in what we can have and they're absolutely visionary. We vision for economic justice a $27 an hour federal minimum wage to start. We vision housing as a human right, housing for all, housing that your mama would live in, right? We vision an educational justice that includes ethnic studies as a core to it, and also says education must be free pre-K through PhD. What we vision not just health care for all, but a health care justice that says everybody has a fundamental right to health care because you were born into this world, right? You were born into this world. So prenatal care, you know, um, maternal care, uh, all kinds of physical health care, mental health resources, um, preventative care, but also addressing medical apartheid and recognizing that black women, especially who stand at the bottom of virtually every single 
social, political, and economic measure are dying of maternal health injustice at rates that surpass most developing nations in the world. And so we have to also say, yes, we want health care for everyone. And we have to undo the apartheid that exists in the existing medical system, right? Um, it includes a gender justice that says, yes, we want gender justice, the immediate publication of the ERA, right? And gender justice also means saying things like Manju, who is one of our leaders in Operation Period. She's the, the very young woman who initiated Operation Period and said something that Sister Sharon, I don't think you or I ever even thought of in terms of gender justice, which is free period products that are plentiful for everyone, right? It's like toilet paper. Right. It's just like toilet paper. And Manju helped me think about that because she was able to pass in the state of California. She lives in Oregon. But in the state of California, she got legislation passed where every um, publicly owned building has to have free period products. And I walked into the bathroom at Cal State LA one day and I took a picture of the basket that holds the tampons and sent it to Manju and just said, thank you. But then the next week I walked into the bathroom and there was a sign in the stall that said, if you need period products, scan this QR code and it'll tell you what office to go to to pick them up. And I was like, that's not how periods work. And so when you say just like toilet paper, I said, if they keep, I, I called the administration and I said, if you don't put the, the, the tampons back in the bathroom, we're going to take all the toilet paper out the men's bathroom and say, scan this QR code. And if you need toilet paper, you can find what building has it, you know? So um, I just think that I'm grateful to the vision of the young people for the vision of the young people. Um, and this platform is really firmly grounded in vision and a vision that is completely untethered from capitalist corporate interests, that's completely untethered from the system of white supremacy that really fertilized this country. This country is built on white supremacy, right? Um, that's completely untethered from the kind of patriarchy and sexism and heterosexism that again, this country is grounded in and has a vision like the earth seeds that Lauren Olamina is planting in, in Parable of the Soar. Um, it, it is about what it is we can have. We seek to be visionary. That's right. And I, I believe that we can have those things. We certainly, possess the resources that are needed to support all of those pillars. But what we're what we need, and I think what you and um, Dr. West are doing is you're basically trying to create a new political landscape. And um, that is a, a monumental task. So in doing that, uh, what became clear to me, because I support what you and Cornell West are doing, but what became clear to me is that we don't have a mechanism or a road to create a new political landscape. You know, we have electoral politics on the one hand, and then we have uh, boots on the ground, marches and uh, disruptions. And But there's nothing sort of in between. Like we had Occupy, and then when Occupy was shut down, because we don't have Public, the public sphere anymore. We, we, that was um, a brilliant uh, strategy of the um, corporatocracy to get rid of the public sphere. So there's really no place for us to come together and to do some brain work and to try to affect a new political landscape. So I want to ask you, what is going to happen with this movement? Because I believe that what you and Cornell West are doing is you're creating a movement. But this movement has to move beyond electoral politics in order to have real power. Is 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 that do you is do you agree with that? Absolutely. So 
this is again grounded in the work of movements already, right? So, so the work that we've been doing in Black Lives Matter and now Black Lives Matter grassroots is the boots on the ground work of Black Lives Matter, right? Um, the work that we've do been doing for more than 11 years now actually, you know, kind of informs some of the electoral strategy. So when we talk about things like what does public safety look like, it comes from the work of Black Lives Matter and all of those prison and police abolitionists before the Black Lives Matter movement, right? The reparations work comes from before this run, right? And we know that Dr. West was deeply involved in reparations work and has been for the last 40 plus years, right? And so it's informed by movement and it seeks to feed movement. So that was a fundamental question around the campaign in the first place, right? Does this take away from movement or can it be used to amplify and grow movement? And so our intention is very, very clear that it's meant to amplify as well as feed movement. And it derives a lot of its power from movement. And so, you know, one of the things, as you said, there is no public sphere or they're killing. Um, and when they, I talk about they, I'm talking about those same interests that want to say, you know, we can't afford a $15 an hour minimum wage or free um, college or free education or free health care. Those same interests are deathly afraid of public sphere. And so if you look at what's happening all around this country, um, around the, again, it's the young people who are visionary and courageous around the Free Palestine Movement and how um, many of these universities are now coming out with ordinances banning free speech. Universities, think about the hypocrisy, banning free speech. And then municipalities are following suit, banning free speech. Banning public health in many senses. Um, Sharon, you know this about me, that I'm one who has diligently masked for my own public health. I'm on Zoom now, so I don't have a mask on. But if you see me in public, I almost always have on a mask unless I'm eating or speaking and I'm away from people, right? I almost always have on a mask. Well, the University of California and CSU just said you can't wear masks. What? What, right? And this is all their way of really trying to disrupt the public sphere that's been ushered in through the Free Palestine Movement, through these student encampments on campuses and in community. And we have to push back against that. And one of the ways that we're doing that is through this electoral process. And if you um, kind of watch the way Dr. West and I have been campaigning when we go places for fundraisers, the only way, and, and we have very limited um, opportunity to do that because we don't have big funds, right? And our fundraisers, the fundraiser we did recently in the Bay Area was hosted at my cousin's barbershop, right? And so these are regular brothers in West Oakland who are coming in, downtown in West Oakland, who are coming in to get a haircut might have an extra $5, right? So that's the kind of fundraiser we tend to have. But whenever we do a fundraiser that same day, we also do a community conversation where it's completely open and free. We don't even ask for donations, right? Um, but it's an opportunity to engage. Without that engagement, we talked about Manju and Operation Period. We wouldn't have that built into our gender justice platform because Dr. West is... And I've now learned to say it unapologetically. He's the smartest human being I know. He's the yeah. smartest human being I know. And he doesn't know everything. And, mm -hmm. you know, so when we have collective conversation, when there is a public sphere, we have an opportunity to derive wisdom from all of us, from all of us and move this forward through all of us. And then I'll, I'll end the response by saying this. Um, two weeks ago, I had a last minute opportunity to go to London for just for the weekend, which is crazy because who goes to London for the weekend? But it was, you know, I was like, OK, you know, I wasn't going to go because it came up like with two days notice. And 
But then I talked to my folks and they were like, why not? It's, you know, go to sleep on the plane, get off the plane, go do what you got to do and then get back on the plane and sleep on the plane and come home. So I did. That's what my daughter said to do and what my mama said to do. So I went. And on Sunday, um, one of our members, two of our members are actually Black Brits, right? And I said, what do I do today? Because it's Saturday. I had gone to Brixton and then Sunday, I didn't know what to do. And they said, well, go to Hyde Park to this area called Speaker's Corner. And I don't know if you've ever been there. Yes, I have. But talk about public sphere, right? It's this place where there's hundreds of people who are not trained, don't have money, um, you know, don't have even bullhorns, you know, where yeah. they just come and they have these little conversations. Like sometimes there'll be three people talking about gender roles and sometimes there'll be 20 people talking about Palestine and you can kind of hop from pod to pod and sometimes listen and sometimes join in. And so that's public sphere. And so when we think about the U.S. and we think about Los Angeles as both of our home now, um, I thought about Africatown, also known as Lamert Park, which is that, but it's not really organized as that. And so Black Lives Matter Los Angeles, which is part of Black Lives Matter Grassroots, actually starting this week, um, every second Sunday, we're having something called Conversation Corner. Oh, where great. Yeah, we're encouraging folks and we'll have um, mutual aid to as people leave, send them home with <coughs> with grocery bags. Um, hold on. <coughs> so, yes, we're um, trying to awaken and enliven and um, cement the public sphere um, because that's so, so necessary, um, not just as a counter to like capitalist messaging, which you hear in media um, and kind of overtakes even our own debates. Um, but, you know, we can counter it and also kind of raise up the conversations that are really organic to our own communities. Fantastic. Well, I think now you can share with me your story about how taking that class and how taking that class in high school literally saved your life. Right. So my black studies story, um, and I have many, many black studies stories, but I'll say this, I grew up in Oakland, California, um, in East Oakland, California. Um, and I say that because it's really important to be clear that I wasn't raised in the Oakland Hills. I wasn't raised in Piedmont, Piedmont. I wasn't even raised in North Oakland. I was raised in East Oakland, which is um, a neighborhood at, at, during my generation that was hit really, really hard by crack cocaine. Um, and so there was, it was a beautiful neighborhood in that it was um, one where we were all tightly bound and had all kinds of adventures that you couldn't have. Now our favorite thing to do during the summers was fence hopping and taking neighbors' plums off their trees, right? Now now if people saw a bunch of eight-year-olds in their trees, they might shoot them, right? But but then in the 80s, um, you know, that's, that's the thing that we did as little kids. And then as I came of age in the 90s, early 90s, that's when crack was really taking hold late 80s early 90s crack is taking hold and a lot of the kids that were in the neighbor's trees picking plums with me um were now you know selling drugs or their parents were taking drugs and um there was a lot of violence in my neighborhood and my mother um saw to it that i didn't go to the neighborhood schools which um were really hit hard by it. And so rather than going to Fremont High School, which was a school that I was assigned to go to, um, where another neighborhood in East Oakland also went um, that we didn't get along with. So I'm from an area called Funk Town, and there's an, another area called 69th Village, which um, was warring 
and both of the, this is how we talk about institutional racism and things being by design. Um, even though I lived up the street from Oakland High School, kids in Funktown were zoned to go to Fremont High School where the kids from 69th Village also went, which meant that Fremont High School had this just um, the level of violence at the school, especially my senior year and shootings at the school, especially my senior year was just um, tragic, but that's not the right word because it was by design, you know? So my mom sent me to school in Berkeley. So every morning I would get up starting in the seventh grade, I would get up at five o'clock in the morning and walk down to the bus and um, take the public bus from where I lived in East Oakland to Berkeley, which took about a little over an hour to get there. And went to junior high in Berkeley and then went to high school in Berkeley. And at the time, Berkeley High School was the only high school in the country with not just a black studies class, but a black studies department that was brilliantly led by someone who I continue to Google him and maybe one day I'll do it. Maybe I'll get with his kids and do it. Um, but there's no record of him really, except for those of us who have been, had our lives saved by Richard Navies, right? Um, Richard Navies was the head of the black studies department and he um, created this department, built this department that allowed us as black kids, and we were the plurality of Berkeley High School, black students were the plurality of Ber Berkeley High School. Instead of taking American history, you could take African American history. Instead of taking regular English, you could take black gold English. Instead of um, taking, you know, uh, Spanish, you could take Swahili, right? And so you found this haven inside these black studies classes that affirmed who you are as an intellectual being, as a creative be being, you know, as a, one of my best friends in high school was this boy named Amir who was hilarious. And, you know, Mr. Navies was not hilarious, right? He was very serious and had a bald head and wore a dashiki every day. But I remember we would come into class and the classrooms were always set up as a circle. And um, Mr. Navies in his deep booming voice would like play some, he would play jazz. You know, he called it classical black music. And you'd walk in and when we got in, he'd go, now write down your thoughts, right? And you write your thoughts and it could be anything, a story, a poem. Um, and Amir, who was the class clown, would always like write something funny, like a joke, right? And I remember Amir would sometimes read these jokes and Mr. Navies would try to be this stoic, <laughs> strong black man in the dashiki and he would have to like turn away from the circle so we wouldn't see him like break character and laugh at Amir's jokes, right? But this was this beautiful space that had been created um, inside Berkeley High School and really uh, planted seeds for me. And um, eventually by the 11th grade, kind of what had happened in my neighborhood and what was happening in black urban America um, caused me to drop out of high school or traditional high school. And I, my mom wound up trying to get my brother out of there and she moved to a suburban area, um, kind of some of those new tracks, right? Those new developments with cul-de-sacs that you could move, you know, 30 minutes outside of the city and live in. And I didn't want to go with her, so I didn't. And I stayed in Oakland or I went for a minute and then went back to live with my dad in Oakland, my biological dad in Oakland. And I wound up dropping out of high school and went to independent studies but it was the seeds that had been planted in those black studies classes that not only in my senior year got me to go back to high school, but encouraged me to at least apply to college and apply as the only thing I could ever imagine doing, um, which was be an African-American studies major. And so without 
Mr. Navies without Black studies, I'm sure, and during that year that I was at, at um, independent studies, essentially preparing for my GED, I had gone to jail. I had, um, you know, been mixed up in all kinds of stuff. And by jail, I mean like, you know, youth jail, right? Um, been mixed up in all kinds of stuff. I watched as many of the kids who were in the plum trees with me before um, had been killed, um, including one of my first boyfriends by boyfriend. I mean, you know, the, those guys that you would talk on the phone to sneak and talk on the phone to not a real, not a real boyfriend. Curtis Belton was my talking to the cover quiet person, right? Who we call each other boyfriend and girlfriend, right? Um, Curtis was killed when he was 14 years old. Um, witnessed all of this, right? Witnessed all of this. And um, were it not for Black studies, I don't, I, I know I wouldn't be here because there are incidents that I know would have stolen my life. And it's only God and my mama and my grandparents and Black studies that that brought me back from it. So I'm sorry for the long story, but um, very, very grateful for the role Black Studies played in my life. And I intend and have worked to make that the truth of what Black Studies is. Um, as the former chair of Pan-African Studies and is now a professor of Pan-African Studies, I'm no longer chair, but I still teach and have been teaching Pan-African Studies for 22 years now. Um, that it's more than a set of ideas. It's more than correcting the record. Um, it's also moving forward with a particular ethic that, you know, we're we're awakening awakening the intellectual tools that our people have, so that they can use them for the freedom of our folks. Yes, yes. Well, that's quite a story. Um, I didn't know any of that stuff about you. Sadly, yeah. I wish it was. A unique story, but there are so many stories like that without people. Um, it's almost like your your zip code destines your your future. It determines what path you have the ability to even see. You know, That's you can't. You don't even have the ability to create the kind of vision that would be a healthy uh, future for yourself because of the the traumas that you experience and the kinds of lives that are modeled for you when you live in those constrained conditions. I'm from the projects in the Bronx and I got a lot of stories too. So I, I want to hear some of them when we, when we have an opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Melina, it's just, it's been such a pleasure talking to you. I wish you and Dr. West the best. I admire what you are attempting to accomplish. Um, it's needed. And everyone needs to support, regardless of where you stand on the politi political spectrum, this movement needs support. And so where would people go to make donations, to um, just to, to provide support? Sure. So the collective campaign, the the um, we say we're a people powered campaign. So you're absolutely right. We need everybody, all hands on deck. Um, you can go to cornellwest2024.com. That's C-O-R-N-E-L West, just one L. Cornellwest2024.com. And you can sign up to be what we call a love warrior, which is um, the folks who are helping to advance this campaign. And anything you have to offer from a dollar to an hour of, of knocking on doors to um, this week, there was a brother who just did an Instagram post and said, if y'all need graphics or um, video editing between now and the campaign, I got you. And we immediately reached out and yeah, he got us. And so we thank Brother Youssef for that. So anything that you have to bring to the campaign or to the movement, bring it. Um, and then again, we are using the campaign as a way to amplify movement. So the work that we do all around the country is under the banner of BLM Grassroots. And so that's on all social media, BLM Grassroots, blmgrassroots.org. And I want to be very clear that when I say the work that we do, I mean the work that I do as, as a Black Lives Matter Grassroots co-founder and organizer and we intend to feed movement 
absolutely be informed by ideas, but we also know, and I have to say it, that we're not conflating the two and we would never take resources from the movement to run a campaign, but we intend to make sure that people understand that the ideas that we have and are advanced in the policy pillars come from somewhere. And if you believe in that work, then please plug into the work beyond, um, beyond November 6th. Thank you so much, Melina Abdullah. We wish you the best and we welcome you to come back um, after November 6th, before November 6th. Just keep plugging in your truths and your vision is so important. Thank you Thank for being you so much. Today. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for sticking around. If you like the LA Progressive content and the discussions we have here, please consider clicking the subscribe button below and also give us a thumbs up. That helps to grow our audience by feeding the algorithm, which helps to get this content in front of more eyes. Thanks for stopping by. We really appreciate your support.